In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear Reverend Father, dear brothers and seminarians, dear faithful, I thought that since today is both the second Sunday of Lent and usually uh, the Feast of St. Patrick, it would be a good day for us to reflect upon the mortification of St. Patrick and his great battles against the devil that we try to reproduce at the time of Lent. We all know how difficult we find it to mortify ourselves and to fight against the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And this is why it's so necessary for us to be familiar with the heroes of our faith. They are a very great inspiration to us when we learn about how they faced those same battles that, that we face today. They are, the saints, in the end, are extraordinary witnesses to the fact that our faith is the true faith. They are proof that the strength of our Lord Jesus Christ is greater than all strength. And they are signs of what can happen to us in our own lives if we just give ourselves over to God with a greater firmness of will, as they did. And if we do not compare ourselves with the saints, if we do not make ourselves familiar with the lives of these great heroes of our faith, we only end up comparing ourselves with the people of the world. And in comparison with them, we may seem to be heroic in our devotion to God, when in fact we may be quite tepid. If you light a match in the middle of the night, in the darkness, it seems like a very great light. But if you light a match in broad daylight, it seems very insignificant. So too are our lives in comparison with the saints, like that match in broad daylight as, compa it, as com compared to us comparing our lives with those of the world. So let us consider the life of St. Patrick because his life is a model of total commitment to the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ and he should be a great inspiration to us. We have to understand that before St. Patrick was a great apostle, he began by developing a very great love of God. Decades before he was given the mission to convert the Irish nation, before he had any clue that he would be given that mission, he was spending long hours in mortification and prayer. And the difficulties of his early life were quite extreme. He went through some very traumatic events at a young age, yet those events only served to sanctify him. When he was just 16 years old, there were some Irish marauders who raided the, the coast of Scotland and kidnapped him and sold him into slavery to a cruel master named Milchu. And St. Patrick ended up spending six years under this, this man Milchu um, in Ireland, tending uh, his sheep, being a shepherd. And unbeknownst to St. Patrick, those six years were an important preparation for his future apostolic work in converting uh, the island of, of Ireland. Um, it was during that time that he learned the Celtic language perfectly. It was during that time as well that he became very familiar with the Druidical religion that was being practiced um, in, in Ireland at that time, since uh, Mil Milchu was, was a Druidical high priest. But besides this, St. Patrick used his time as a shepherd to advance greatly in holiness. He was already showing at that time how strong his constitution was, how great was his piety, and how much was his love of mortification. In his confessions where he writes a sort of autobiography, his sort of reflections uh, about this time that he spent, this initial time that he spent in Ireland, he says the following, God's fear increased in me more and more, and the faith grew in me, and the spirit was roused, so that in a single day I said as many as a hundred prayers, and in the night nearly the same, so that whilst in the woods and on the mountain, even before the dawn, I was roused to prayer and felt no hurt from it, whether there was snow or ice or rain, nor was there any slothfulness in me such as I see now, because the Spirit was then fervent within me. So reflecting back in those early years, of, of his life, uh, St. Patrick compares himself to his current state and he finds himself very slothful. But we know that, in fact, he did not slacken 
in these great practices of prayer and these great practices of mortification such that we could compare him to the great prophetical figures of the Old Testament or uh, the figure of St. John the Baptist in the level of his mortification. Um, the, this routine of prayer and penance that St. Patrick developed on his own in a pagan country under captivity, he seemed to keep it for the rest of his life. So when we, when we look at the breviary readings for the Feast of St. Patrick, they talk about his... Uh, time when he, when he was in Ireland as a bishop and his prayer routine then. And it doesn't seem that St. Patrick had flagged at all in all of his penitential practices. At that time, St. Patrick would divide the night into three periods. And during the first period, says the breviary, he repeated the first hundred psalms and bent his knees 200 times. During the second, he remained plunged in cold water with heart, eyes, and hands lifted up to heaven, and in that state repeated the remaining 50 psalms. During the third, he took his short rest lying on a bare stone. And we might well think that, well, praying 150, all 150 psalms every day, uh, making 300 genuflections every day as he did, making 700 signs of the cross as St. As Patrick would do every day, and losing all that sleep was a bit much. But let us remember that St. Patrick was a saint and also that he had this incredible constitution. He lived to the age of 106. He didn't die until he was 106 years old. So he could handle it. But let us also remember the great battle that St. Patrick had on his hands in which he was very conscious of. This battle against not flesh and blood, it against the demonic powers. We often suffer temptations in this life. Sometimes they are quite intense. Sometimes we feel powerless against them. And this gives us a taste of, of how fierce is that battle against the angelic powers. We realize at that time that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is against these fallen angelic powers, the devil and his army. And that unless we fortify ourselves against the devil with supernatural power, with a power that's way beyond the powers of our own nature, we have no chance of winning. St. Patrick was very conscious of this, that he would have no strength against the, the wicked forces in Ireland if he did not practice prayer and mortification. He had to go up against the devil more or less face to face. The juridical practices of the Celts were motivated by the devil. They had these satanic overtones about them. And when he went back, the, the Druid priests and chieftains were extremely hostile to the preaching of Catholicism in their land. The, the Pope at the time, Pope St. Celestine, he started by, by naming a certain priest Palladius as the apostle to, to Ireland. Um, but Palladius was absolutely terrified of the Druids, and he abandoned his mission. And so this left open the door for St. Patrick to be named. So St. Celestine commissioned St. Patrick, knowing that he was of stronger character. So as they say, St. Patrick knew what he was up against. He had been in Ireland. He had seen the situation. Um, and he knew that he would face fierce opposition when he stepped back on the island. The Irish had made him a slave for six years, and he was coming to set them free from the slavery of the devil. But our blindness as human beings is such that we often do not know the difference between freedom and slavery. We often think that slavery to the devil is freedom, and the freedom of the sons of God is slavery. And this, is, this was the situation with the Druids at that time. The Druids had two main weapons that they would use against St. Patrick, swords and incantations, these sort of demonic curses that they would hurl against him to try to defeat him. St. Patrick also had two weapons, and it was his weapons that turned out to be stronger. They were miracles and meekness. He wielded the power of God, but he did so in such a humble way that he began to make many conversions in the land. Still, the king of the Druids at the time, Leogar, was firmly opposed to the work of St. Patrick, and he wanted to stop him. 
And at a certain point, he was planning a great druidical feast. And the day that he planned the feast happened to be uh, that year Easter Sunday. It happened to fall on, on Easter Sunday. And he commanded that no one in the kingdom light any fires on that night before they saw that a fire had been lit at the king's palace in Terra. And um, that would indicate that it was the beginning of the feast and everybody else could light their fires. St. Patrick saw this as an opportunity to have a direct confrontation with the Druids and cut off, as it were, the very source of the paganism in the land. So he knew that this confrontation was going to, that he was planning was going to be beyond the merely human, and he prepared himself by composing a prayer, a prayer that has since become famous. You might have heard about it. It's called the Breastplate of St. Patrick. He would say this prayer, as it were, to kind of put on a supernatural armor in facing off against these uh, druidical priests. I bind to myself today God's power to guide me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to teach me, God's eye to watch over me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to give me speech, God's hand to guide me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to shelter me, God's host to secure me. Against the snares of demons, against the seduction of vices, against the lust of nature, against everyone who meditates injury to me, whether far or near, whether few or with many. I invoke today all these virtues against every hostile, merciless power which may assail my body and my soul, against the incantations of false prophets, against the black laws of heathenism, against the false laws of heresy, against the deceits of idolatry, against the spells of women and smiths and druids, against every knowledge that binds the soul of men. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ within me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ at my right, Christ at my left, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks to me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. So St. Patrick, having said his prayer, he arrived at the hill of Slain, at the opposite extremity of the king's palace in, in Terra. It was Easter Eve, and that year, uh, that Paschal Vigil, the day of the Paschal Vigil, happened to fall on the Feast of the Annunciation. It was the 25th of March. And on the summit of the hill, before the king had kindled his fire, St. Patrick lit the Paschal fire. And when the Druids at the king's palace saw this fire of St. Patrick, they said to the king, O king, live forever. This fire, which has been lighted in defiance of the world edict, will blaze forever in this land, unless it be this very night extinguished. They went out to try to extinguish the fire. They tried their best with their incantations, on St. Patrick and on the fire, but they could not touch the fire of the saint. They could not put it out. And the next day, St. Patrick led a procession to the king's palace, one of his deacon, deacons holding the, the book of the Gospels. And again, the Druids came out with their incantations, but they had no effect on St. Patrick. And there was a scene similar to the one that's related about Simon, Simon Magus and, and his opposition to St. Peter, where Simon Magnus was, was lifted off of the ground to show his, his sort of uh, satanic powers, and St. Peter cast him to the ground. Something similar happened here with the chief druid who, who raised himself above the ground, and uh, St. Patrick caused him to, to plunge to his death. And on seeing this, the king, the king Leogar, he was overcome. He realized that uh, he would not have uh, the power to, to brook the wishes of, of St. Patrick, and so he gave St. Patrick the permission to preach the Catholic faith throughout Ireland. That victory did, did not mark the conversion of the king or, or the conversion of the island, uh, the island itself. There were still many, many labors ahead of St. Patrick. 
Um, from that day forward, he traveled all throughout Ireland, spreading the faith and establishing churches. And it is said by, by the time he died, he had established so many parishes in Ireland that he needed to consecrate 350 bishops. He'd consecrated 350 bishops by, by the time of his death. And as I mentioned, even though he, he complained about what he seemed to, to be to him, a relaxing of his penitential spirit, we know that he never relaxed his penitential practices. He always wore a hair shirt. He always uh, had a rock for his pillow. And periodically, he would retire to an isolated spot to spend time in prayer. The, the spot that's known as Crow Patrick, St. Patrick's Mountain. And the most famous episode there was when he spent precisely 40 days and 40 nights in fasting, prayer, and exercises of penance. His purpose was to obtain special blessings for the Irish people whom he had converted to the faith. The first part of his retirement, as, as, as the story goes, was engaged in a great battle against the devil. Um, in the second part, after he had successfully banished the, the, the devil, um, similar to the way that our Lord banished the devil in the gospel of last week, the second part he spent in pleading with God for graces for the, for the Irish. And, and he had this angel that, that he was in communication with. And he would pray for a certain period of time. And then and the angel would come to him and say that that particular petition had been granted. And then he would go to the next petition on his list that he, that he wanted and, and can start praying for that. And then the, the angel would, would come when uh, he got that one uh, granted until he went through the entire list. So he got the whole list of, of his petitions granted. First of all, that many souls would be free from the pains of purgatory through his intercession. Secondly, that whoever would recite his hymn before death in the spirit of penance would save his soul. Thirdly, the barbarian hordes would never obtain sway in the Church of Ireland. Fourthly, that seven years before the Judgment Day, the sea would rise up and spread over Ireland to save the Irish from the temptations and the trials of the, of the time of the Antichrist. And then lastly, that St. Patrick himself would be deputed to judge the whole Irish race on the last day. So in St. Patrick's life, we see this incredible battle with the devil in stark relief. Of course, our own lives are not as dramatic as that of St. Patrick. Our own mission is not as great as the one that he was given. At the same time, the, the, fa the battles that we fight are real. Uh, and they're no different, in essence, from the ones that he waged. We have these same temptations uh, to push us against the will of God. And you obviously have the mission to save your own soul. You have the mission to save the souls of those entrusted to you. The devil wants to prevent you from doing this. And to, to defeat him, you have to use the exact same means that St. Patrick employed to gain his incredible successes. Um, you're going to have to make use of continual prayer and penance. You, you're not necessarily going to pray all 150 psalms every single day, but you, you will have to pray every day. You need to pray your, your daily rosary. You need to pray your morning prayers and your, and your night prayers. You need to have this, the spirit of prayer and the spirit of penance. Um, you must never lose the spirit of prayer and the spirit of penance in your life if you're going to expect to, to save your soul. So in this time of Lent, let, let us um, use the example of St. Patrick as an inspiration to us to be especially generous. Um, the things that we strive for in this life, the things that he strove for, have eternal consequences, much, much more important than these temporal passing things that everyone else seeks after uh, in, in this life. We can think about the great glory of St. Patrick today in heaven. We can think about all those generations of Irish Catholics, the great glories of the Irish nation, all coming, as it were, from that initial work of St. Patrick. All those souls who will gather around St. Patrick on the last day and be able to um, in, give testimony to the blessings that they have received from, from these efforts of his. So we, want, we must have the ambition to have some sort of similar glory in heaven that, uh, 
that at least some people will be able to say that we had a good influence on them, a supernatural influence on them. So let us put on that breastplate of St. Patrick with Christ at our right and our left, behind us and before us, above us and below us, and then go forward into the battle for the things that really matter in this life, virtue, holiness, and life everlasting. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.